So hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to ArchiveX. Today, we're hosting a very special workshop, Always in Time, which is a workshop, an archival workshop for artists and filmmakers and, uh, working with Moving Image. Let me introduce you to our guest presenter, Caroline Hill, a member of the Transfer Collective, is also an Andrew Mellon Fellow in Media Conservation at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She works collaboratively with the media conservation team in the acquisition, exhibition, preventive conservation, and research of the collection's audio, film, video, performance, and software-based artworks. She's a graduate of, graduate of NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program and holds a director of cinematography from the Universidad de Barcelona and BA in Visual Arts. Um, throughout the presentation, feel free to post questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat. I'm going to pass the mic now to Caroline. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining me tonight and thank you for the invitation. Um, like Crystal said, I am I'm Caroline Hill. <laughs> I am speaking to you from the unceded land of the Lenape people. And I just wanted to take a, a moment to honor and pay my respects to the Lenape peoples and their continuing presence in their homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Um, just wanted to, I'm also uh, speaking on behalf of the Transfer Collective. Um, Transfer Collective partners with artists, activists, and community organizations to lower the barriers to preserving at-risk audiovisual media, especially unseen, unheard, or margin marginalized works throughout or through digitization, screenings, educational workshops, and pop-up events. We operate through a non-hierarchical model. Um, we work to create an inclusive environment in which we explore practical methods for media preservation, archiving, and access. Um, those are our social media <laughs> uh, tags, so feel free to, to look us up and learn more about us. Um, in, in this workshop or this webinar, we are going to discuss a couple, a couple of concepts, and I just wanted to, to um, outline them here. Um, we're gonna talk about inventorying your collection. We're gonna cover physical audiovisual formats such as film and videotape. We're gonna talk a, a bit about born digital formats. We're gonna cover best practices for technical documentation, digital preservation strategies, storage for both physical objects, audiovisual uh, carriers and for uh, digital uh, formats or files. And um, finally, I'm going to share some resources um, for uh, further exploration. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, specify that when we talk about media art or what I'll call media art during this presentation um, encompasses different uh, mediums and format types, uh, which can be considered media art or time-based media art. There's a lot of term terminologies uh, for, for this kind of work. But broadly speaking, media art refers to artworks that depend on a technological component to function. Um, the term media applies to any communication device used to transmit and store information. So by incorporating emerging technologies into artwork, artists uh, using new media are constantly redefining the traditional categories <laughs> of art. And I'm sure the audience knows this already, but uh, it's always good to um, clarify that. So over the years, numerous artistic disciplines have fallen under the umbrella term of media art, including the ones that are on this list. Um, one aspect of media art is that it uses technologies that inevi inevitably change over time and the technologies adopted by artists using new media are representative of a given historical period. Um, conservators uh, and curators work together to conserve this history by staying as true to the original artwork as possible given the circumstances. Um, otherwise, the, the historical and technological context of these valuable cultural artifacts are at risk of of being forgotten. 
So the main challenges with this, this type of work are the deterioration of components. And this occurs when part of an artwork no longer functions and cannot be repaired. So over time, all technology is prone to breaking down. That's just a fact of life. Um, so for example, magnetic tape of a video cassette will eventually deteriorate. And this can result in the, uh, a lowering of the image quality or a disappearance of the image uh, uh, yeah, completely. Um, we're also dealing with technological obsolescence. And this occurs when technological equipment becomes outdated and can no longer be uh, used. So electronic companies uh, move on to newer technologies and old mo models are often discontinued uh, or not maintained. So if one component of a media artwork or, or of a system um, uh, becomes unavailable or obsolete or incompatible with new software, the entire work may cease to function. And this is obviously yeah, an issue. Um, so a critical aspect of caring for your artwork or your films is to know what kind of media you have. And so you'll want to ask yourself, uh, what, what are the predominant physical formats in your collection? And, and this will help you kind of guide, guide you through the process of archiving your, your collection, your art. Um, but this may go beyond identifying that identifying that you have like several 60 millimeter films, for example. You, you also want to know or you want to pinpoint whether your films are positive films or if they're negative, if they're reversal, if it's an inter-negative or an inter-positive, whether uh, the films are in color, black and white, what kind of sounds, sound, if any, is present in the, in the films, etc. So. Um, the gist of this is to to say to you that the richer the description that you have, the better the better in the long run. Um, so with magnetic video and, and audio tape, uh, things get a little bit more complicated because these types of formats require playback machines or desk or sorry decks um, to view and or digitize. Um, this is what is sometimes referred to as a magnetic media crisis, which can be broken down as follows, um, like this, this following um, concepts. So magnetic tape is a thin magnetizable coating on a strip of plastic um, that is actively succumbing to the inevitable chemical and physical de degradation of that biological material. There's also the, the fact that the market availability of machines that can decode the content, content contained on these tapes is dwindling, that's a fact, due to technological obsolescence of both their physical parts and the human expertise necessary to maintain them over time. Um, there's a saying within our archiving preservation conservation community that there is a 15 to 20 year window of opportunity to remediate this crisis before content is lost forever. And, and why is this important is because the, mass, the vast majority of late 20th and early 21st century history and events were recorded on magnetic tape. And, and, and we can see this uh, with this um, sort of like display of uh, magnetic tape over time, starting with Umatic uh, or three quarter inch tape, which was introduced in 1978 on to VHS and VHSC and Batacam, Mini DV, et cetera, et cetera. So with all of this, I want to say that it's generally recommended to, to digitize magnetic tape as soon as possible because the machines, like I said, used to play them uh, are getting harder and harder to find and maintain. So, but before digitizing, you, you, you must visually inspect a tape to determine its physical condition and also to determine what it is. <laughs> so the, the, this visual inspection will help you get an estimate for digitization, whether you're working with an outside vendor or if you're sourcing equipment to digitize at home. The elemental note is to inspect and take notes of what you're seeing or what you're observing. Um, 
Ideally, you would do this on an item level spreadsheet or a notebook. Um, a piece of advice is that some videotape models allow you for allow for you to peek inside uh, through kind of like a little window uh, to see if there's presence of mold or any shedding of the actual tape. Um, mold can appear as a powdery white substance that appears to grow or spread on the tape or on, on its housing. And shedding looks like, uh, like rusting uh, or, or debris. Um, you can also open up the tape transport panel as, as you can see in the picture here to visually inspect the, the tape itself. Generally, you want to know that the condition of your tape or, or the film uh, and, and the condition of the housing. So you want to know if there's any damage present like water damage, if there's mold or fungus, if the tape or film is rewound evenly, if the tape or film looks shrunken or brittle. These are all kind of like red flags that you want to want to note. Um, Additionally, you want to take notes of any information that can be gathered from annotations on the container or, or the sleeves of the, of the tape or the film. Like, for example, like if, if the tape is NTSC or PAL, what kind of format it is, what generation, if it's a master or, or a matrix, if it's a duplicate or an exhibition copy, etc. You want to you wanna take note of these things. When we enter the digital realm, the same principles apply when you're kind of like inspecting uh, the, the physical object. The physical condition, condition of what we refer to as a carrier will also be something that you want to take note of. So when examining, for example, uh, a digital media carrier, which could be a flash drive, a hard drive, an XD, SD card, etc. You want to see if there are any scratches or dents, if uh, what kind of port, if it's an external drive, what kind of port does it have? Does it come with a cable? Is the cable frayed or torn? Um, broadly speaking, there are generally, or <laughs> broadly speaking, there are many types of hard drives out there in the world. <laughs> there are internal, external, solid state, uh, et cetera. Um, broadly speaking, they use magnetic storage to store and retrieve digital information with rotating platters. Um, solid state are a little bit different in that they don't have moving parts and are more similar to flash uh, storage. And that's why they're considered a little bit more uh, robust or, or better to store for storage. Um, there's also the different connections. So there's USB 2, 3, 3.1, generation 2, USB C, Thunderbolt, etc. So there's like different uh, connection types. Um, the, the, the biggest difference you'll notice is with, with all of these different uh, connection types is the transfer speed. So USB 2, for example, would transfer up to 480 megabytes per second, and USB 3 will transport uh, five gigabytes and, and so on. So um, there's a difference in with regards to speed. The storage capacity on these are anywhere from a few gigabytes to multiple terabytes. Some, some drives require software installation, but once you're connected to a USB or Firewire, you can generally drag and drop uh, files onto them. Um, external drives can also be formatted for specific types of operating systems. This is just some another thing that you want to note. So if your uh, external hard drive is formatted for Windows, or if it's Mac formatted, this is uh, uh, an important piece of information for, for your future self. Um, I wanted to make a, a distinction that the quality of an external drive can vary greatly. And so it's a good idea to check reviews for drives or to find a hard drive reliability report. And these are usually created by industry groups. 
and include information for failure rates for specific models of drives from a variety of manufacturers. And so here I'm including Backblaze uh, 2020 <laughs> hard drive failure rate chart. Um, this basically tells you uh, which drives to avoid and which ones to buy. Um, external hard drives come with their own preservation risks. They're not all made equally. And, and, and so reports like this can provide or like give you insight into, into kind of their uh, suitability. Current guidelines recommend replacing external, dri uh, external drives every three to five years and checking on any backed up materials on drives at least once a year. Um, some companies have higher failure rates than others. Um, so it, another thing to note is that the more write and erase cycles that you use, the higher the chance for your drive to fail. So if you're, you have a hard drive that you used in, in production of a film, for example, maybe don't use that hard drive uh, for long-term storage. Um, external hard drives, like all of the digital media carriers, are susceptible to bit rot and file corruption, which I'll, I'll explain later, but it's just another thing that we uh, have to, to deal with. Um, hard drives should be encased in a hard shell uh, of some sort and kept in a stable environment of between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit with uh, 35 to 45% of relative humidity. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, you also want to avoid um, abrupt changes in temperature and humidity wherever you, you store these. So depending on where you are in your career, you, you may also uh, recognize optical, optical media or what we call optical media carriers. Um, and this includes DVDs, CD-ROMs, Blu-ray, CDs, audio CDs, etc. So optical discs are storage media that hold content in digital form that are written and read by a laser. Um, like I said, these include like all the various uh, CD and DVD variations. Um, if you have a lot of these in, in, in your collection, it can be difficult to distinguish between a CD and a DVD. Um, considering that they pretty much look the same. Um, but if the disc doesn't state whether it's a DVD or a CD, uh, it could have an identifier in the tiny plastic center in the middle. So it, it usually uh, says what, what it is. <laughs> um, another way is that a CD, for example, we ha will have like a slight green tint. Uh, or a blue color like, um, and, and a blank DVD, for example, is uh, more dark purplish. Um, another thing to note is that, um, see, like rewritable optical media, like CD, RW, DVD, RW, et cetera, uh, have a life expectancy of 25 years. Um, Less information is known about CD-ROMs and DVD-ROMs, um, resulting in an increased level of uncertainty <laughs> for their life expect expectancy. Um, if you don't have an optical disk drive, you can tell if there's content on them by observing the burn marks on one side. You'll, you'll notice that it looks different. Um, like uh, almost like a concentric circle. And um, like with all other carriers, you can check for damage like scratches um, or any annotations written on it. Um, if there's a Sharpie or marker on an optical disc, this is probably not good <laughs> because that ink can actually sink into the disc. So you'll want to, um, migrate the data on those disks as soon as possible. Um, the storage capacities uh, for these disks can range from 4.7 gigabytes to 9.4 gigabytes. Um, 
the makeup of Blu-ray discs is similar to DVDs and can have capa like larger capacity, so like 25 gigabytes to, to 50 gigabytes. However, um, I just wanted to note as well that there hasn't been a lot of testing and research around the archival quality and capacities of uh, high definition DVDs and Blu-rays. So I would generally advise against backing up your work on optical media. Um, finally, we have born digital formats, uh, which I'm sure you've encountered in your, <laughs> in your daily life uh, and work. Um, born digital file types include like numerous uh, types of files. Um, digital still image, moving image, software code, databases, et cetera. But um, we're gonna focus on image, video, and audio. So just uh, some basic definitions. Digital still images are uh, encoded representations of tonal and brightness information of a subject, uh, also known as a grid or a raster of pixels plotted, plotted into a bitmap. Um, the term raster data is often contrasted with vector data in which geometrical points, lines, curves, and shapes uh, are based on mathematical equations that create uh, an image without a specific mapping of data to pixel. Um, so an example of digital still images are TIFF, JPEGs, P PNGs, GIFs, et cetera. And, and Technical information about these files that are important uh, to keep track of are their bit depth, spatial resolution, their color encoding, et cetera. Uh, with digital video, this is um, sort of similar. It's uh, an electronic representation of moving images in the form of encoded digital data. Um, so digital video is a stream that has been created or converted into digital form encoded as numerical samples in continuous sequence. So each frame consists of a series of pixels with a determined resolution um, that is determined by the relative number of pixels of a frame. So this is what we call standard definition, high definition, ultra high def, et cetera. Um, digital video formats are generally composed of both a wrapper format, uh, this is like the common name associated with the file extension, and the encoding method or, or codec. Um, examples of these are QuickTime, uh, .mov, Advanced Video Encoding, MPEG-4, uh, Audio Video Interleave, A AVI, AVI is what we call um, and important characteristics for these files are their size. They, they tend to be pretty large. Uh, their codecs, the frame rate, whether they're interlaced or not, chromosome sampling, the duration, the channels, bit depth, etc. These are things that you, again, want to keep track of. We, with audio uh, or digital audio, we, we define that as an audio waveform that has been created or converted into digital form encoded as numerical samples in continuous sequence. So this uh, means sample death over samples per second. So the graphical representation that you often see of audio, like that squiggly line uh, of peaks and falls represents that waveform waveform. Um, and examples of these types of files are MP3, WAV files, AIF, and FLAC. Uh, and technical characteristics uh, that are important are its duration, channels, channel mapping, sampling frequency, and bit depth. Um, so now that we... <laughs> Now that we got that uh, behind us, <laughs> um, if you have a lot of if you have a lot of physical media in your collection, or if you work across mediums, uh, I highly suggest creating an inventory or a spreadsheet. It can be something like Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet where you have an item level register of what you have and where it is. Um, 
based on your capacity, you might even be able to record or notate if your collection has any pressing needs. For example, if you have a large collection of umatics videotape that represents your early career masters and their exhibiting conservation issues, such as mold, binder hydrolysis, etc., you might choose to separate that from the rest of the collection and prioritize those tapes for digitization. Um, if you hadn't take the, taken the time to inventory and survey your collection, you may not have known where to start or notice the physical degradation of your media or other important information which will help you prioritize uh, um, based on your collection's needs. So uh, here in the slide, you can see some basic fields that you could include in your inventory. So title, media type, meaning whether it's like 60 millimeter positive film or if it's a pneumatic tape. You want to include descriptions or annotations on the tape. You wanna uh, include the generation, whether it's a, a, an exhibition copy or if it's a master or a matrix uh, tape. You wanna include where that uh, media is located so a box number, for example, and you want to uh, include a unique ID for that physical object. It can be a series of numbers, um, but this will help you kind of gain intellectual control of your collection. If you if you work with complex media installations, or if you or if you work with software or code. Um, again, I highly recommend getting into the practice or the habit of creating technical documentation of, of your work. Um, this would include writing a tech manual with um, a meta narrative describing the key concepts and elements of the piece and how it works. Kind of like a bird's eye view of, of the functioning of, of that uh, installation, for example. You also want to include a detailed setup procedure, including pictures, uh, pictures of, of uh, like a successful installation or like the first installation that you did of that given work, etc. You want to include wiring diagrams, um, acoustic conditions, sample layouts, um, and, and kind of like um, include in that manual your preferences for the display of that artwork. Um, you want to include uh, how to maintain uh, or clean the piece, how to turn it off, how to turn it on, um, and include, include a bill of materials uh, or a bill of um, equipment needed to, to make that artwork run. You can also prepare one or several flash drives, for example, with all of the source code for your project, including firmware, firm, firmware, uh, binaries, media assets, schematics, uh, 3D printout files, it, it, everything. And then add uh, installers for the dependencies uh, for, for, for the software, for the given software that you would be using. Um, these flash drives, uh, you can think of them as a time capsule that holds the instructions required to reproduce that work. Also, you, depending, depending on the artwork, right, but you, you would prepare a toolkit with any drill bits or special tools or adapters or spare components that you think would be hard to come by in the future. So you're kind of like uh, future-proofing uh, your, your installation or your artwork. Um, just, just because I've been working in, in museums for, for the past uh, couple of years, uh, I just wanted to note that if you sell your work to a museum or to a private collector, this baseline documentation will absolutely ensure amongst other things, but will ensure the proper display and exhibition and maintenance of, of your work. So, so you're um, contributing to the longevity of, of your work in that collection. 
Um, so now we, we're gonna talk a little bit about the use of preservation and strategies and kind of like the basic concepts. So uh, to define uh, digital preservation, uh, I, I, we can define it as a series of managed activities or actions taken to ensure the accurate rendering of digital content for as long as necessary, regardless of media failure or technolo technological change. Um, uh, digital files, unlike books or paper, degrade uh, at a much faster rate than other media. So this is why this is so, so important. Um, the main activities to consider when preparing to, to archive your own files are to, number one, identify which files are the most important to you and, you, and your collection or your, your um, uh, corpus. Um, so you have to make a decision or you have to choose what, what, what you feel is most important and what you can't live without. Um, are you gonna save your project files? Are you gonna save your, if you're working, in, if you're editing your own work, uh, are you gonna save your edit decision list, et cetera? You also want to organize the files in a way which makes sense to you, but is also intuitive to somebody else. Um, I, I recommend creating a README file to help your future self understand how you organize your files uh, better. Another strategy is to make copies of your files and store them in different geographic locations. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, I wanted to make the caveat that you want to resist relying solely on one method of storage. So for example, it resists relying on cloud for storage, for example. For example, uh, or uh, to clarify what I mean by that is that a cloud is just another server managed by a stranger. It's, it's just another comp somebody else's computer. So you want to diversify your storage media. You also want to regularly check your files to make sure that they're still viewable and keep your replications up to date. Um, so you do this by creating a quick document to keep track of, of how you're syncing your files. Over time, data can degrade. Um, Storage media can deteriorate and files may be corrupted when they are transferred from one place to another. So data integrity is easily compromised when digital preservation best practices are not followed. As a result, zeros may change into ones or vice versa, which is what we call flip bits. Entire sections of files can be lost and data can, now, can no longer be viewed or decoded. Um, Bit rot, or what we call format rot, is also is, is the inability to access digital data because the file format is obsolete and compatible applications no longer exist to read it. Um, this is counteracted by the act of uh, fixity, which um, in, in, in a preservation sense, means the assurance that a digital file has remained unchanged or, or fixed. Um, fixity doesn't just apply to files, but to any digital object that has a series of bits inside it. Um, fixity could be applied to images or to a video file uh, or to, in, I mean, I mean, sorry to individual files uh, or to um, a body of files, uh, say like a sit, uh, uh, like a sit or a tar of files. Um, um, let's see. Um, how, how can you tell if, um, if a file has experienced uh, bit rot or format rot? You do this uh, by uh, generating a checksum uh, for, for your files. And so a checksum is, um, 
sort of a digital fil fingerprint whereby even the smallest change to the file will cause the checksum to change completely. So a checksum is um, an algorithmic uh, sequence uh, of numbers and letters that is unique to your file. Um, and so if that, if that uh, checksum changes over time, you, know, you now know that your file uh, may be corrupted. Some basic tips for file management uh, and, and like naming your files, and this will, will truly help you, um, is to, to come up with some kind of consistent way for naming files and arranging your folders. Uh, you also want to document your file naming scheme uh, for others uh, who may uh, work with your files after you. And, um, just general rule of thumb, thumb uh, you want to implement a clearly defined system. So you want to name, name your files and your folders in a consistent way um, to, to maintain organizational control over your collection. Uh, you want to keep names relatively short. Uh, your naming convention should have the intention to clarify content and maintain organization, not, not do the work of cataloging. <laughs> so you want maybe you, you may want to include some descriptive information in your file name, but you don't want to include like a whole whole uh, catalog record for, for, for that file. Um, you want to name in a way that makes files and folders easily searchable. Um, uh, this speaks to the point of discoverability and maintaining organization, but not intending to provide contextualization uh, the way a full catalog would. Uh, another super important uh, rule of thumb is to not use uh, what we call illegal characters, which is the number sign, the dollar sign, uh, the exclamation point, the ad. Uh, these are characters that a computer will not process correctly in different in different systems, uh, which could result in missing files or uh, information being processed incorrectly or read incorrectly. Another important rule of thumb is to not rename your camera original files if you intend to keep them. The camera assigned file names are important to maintain original order but also for the purposes of authenticity, if, if you care about that thing uh, in, your, in your studio. And so files should be kept in information packages and tied to, to related projects. Um, so uh, keep all, all of the files uh, pertinent to, to your project or, or to an artwork uh, in the same kind of directory or in the same kind of bundle. Another kind of like obvious uh, rule of thumb is to keep your fine file names uh, unique. Now let's talk about uh, embedded metadata. Metadata is data about data. Um, and, and embedding metadata is considered uh, best practice when it comes to long-term preservation because it um, it gives descriptive information about a file and its contents uh, and as it is directly attached to the file. So the metadata will remain with the file regardless of obsolescence or changes in software. So tagging digital files with information relating to subject, location, or adding descriptive details within the file itself is a basic form of embedding metadata. And this can be done super simply, super quickly by selecting the get info for a file uh, by right clicking on a file. Um, digital cameras also automatically embed information, including like geo geolocation information on on on, on camera files. Um, but also a variety of photo editing tools can assist in embedding metadata in a more extensive manner. Um, uh, a, a good one uh, for that kind of work is Adobe Breach. But you should be aware that some photo editing and photo managing software do not store descriptive information with the file, but as a separate uh, 
kind of like sidecar file. Um, and here I'm also recommending Media Info, which is a free and open source tool that displays technical metadata about your files. Um, and this will come handy uh, if you if you start keeping an inventory of of your of your collection. So now we're we going to talk about digital storage. Um, some basic principles. Uh, digital storage is not uh, just the device or the service you use to hold your videos. It's also uh, a set of actions and practices to ensure that your media stays intact, secure, and accessible. Um, making copies, checking files, controlling access, and refreshing your devices are simple strategies for keeping your videos or, or other files safe while in storage. The type and method of storage depends on the number of factors, including on a number of factors, sorry, including your budget, <laughs> the, 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 the size of your collection, your expertise, like your technical know-how, and your existing storage uh, solutions. There is now no one correct method, um, but um, we generally recommend using the three to one rule, which is to make three copies, save at least two on different types of storage media and save one in a different location from where you live. So for example, um, you can perform monthly backups on an external one terabyte drive, and you can set up like a Google Calendar reminder to, to remind you to do that. Um, and you can do that uh, backup uh, transfer overnight. Um, you could do an additional backup on two additional external hard drives using a hard drive clone device. Um, and send one of those hard drives to, to your parents' uh, home or to a good a near and dear friend's uh, home that lives um, in another state, for example. Um, and you can keep the other uh, hard drive in your office or in your studio, for example. So keep one in your home, keep one in your studio, send one to your family or to your friend for, for them to keep. That's, that's an example of, an, of a strategy that you could employ. Um, you could also add to that using, you know, there's uh, various um, like cloud services like Dropbox or Google Drive that you can uh, use as your third kind of like cloud copy. Um, let's see. When, when you're trying to make your decision about digital storage, again, you want to consider uh, the size of your collection, so the number of items, the hours of content, or what are we talking about? Are we talking about terabytes or gigabytes? Are you expecting your collection to grow? How often you'll need access to, to those files? Where you'll need access to those files? Who else may need access, your assistant or uh, your galleries, etc. Uh, these are things to keep in mind uh, when you're uh, kind of like devising your uh, salad <laughs> of, of digital so storage options. Um, this should not deter you from making that decision. So you want to be flexible. So whichever storage medium you choose, you want to keep things as organized and as documented as possible. Uh, you may also consider to utilize a range of storage options as secondary backups or copies of your files. And so here in the slide, um, uh, uh, we'll go like super quickly on, on the different kind of types. Um, so, you know, there's the usual uh, portable hard drive, which is super common and um, like accessible, economical. Um, um, and, and like I said before, I strongly encourage you to read uh, user reviews on, on, on hard drives to, to aid in selecting what to buy. The disadvantages with this kind of storage media is that uh, 
drives are format independent and sometimes are not interoperable between Mac and PC. Um, they need to be exercised. So the spinning disk inside where all of the information lives, it needs to move uh, with some sort of regularity. And you need to uh, swap them out, like I said before, every three to five years. Um, there's also external hard drives without the, the enclosures. And these are portable drives that, um, that are actually external drives. Um, um, and these are kind of like more, um, if you buy them without the enclosure, it can lower the cost depending on the brand. Um, but you need uh, kind of like a, a, a an enclosure to read uh, the, the the external hard drive. There's also uh, what we call a NAS or a network attached storage, which is uh, ideal for collections larger than one terabyte or collections that need to be accessed by multiple users um, because. Um, these, these are, like I said, networked. Um, and so they can be used and re, uh, the files in this uh, drive can be used by multiple users. Um, they're relatively affordable, um, higher end range from um, 500, depending, depending on the capacity. There's also LTO tape, which is linear ta tape open, uh, which is uh, a pretty stable storage medium. Um, the tapes themselves are roughly about 50 to $70 for two terabytes uh, of, of capacity. But you, again, you also need a drive to read them. Um, there's also cloud, which is ideal for small, smaller collections or collections that need to be accessed by, different, by people in different locations or by users um, with stable internet access. The disadvantages of the cloud is that, again, you need substantial bandwidth to upload or download files. And, and obviously, the ongoing subscription fees uh, is something to take into account. Finally, we have flash uh, uh, memory, which is ideal only for transferring content um, and storing files temporarily. So this is for small collections that be, need to be moved. So this is like more for like a production uh, environment. Um, so how to store your physical media? Uh, a general rule of thumb is to store film in chemically inert uh, or polypropylene cans uh, in a cool and dry environment. Uh, for home collections or for artist collections, a cool, uh, so uh, room temperature or below, slightly below, relatively dry, so 35 to 40% relative humidity, clean, stable environment. So avoid attics, basements, and other locations with high risk of leaks uh, are, are good places to store your physical media carriers. Uh, for uh, magnetic media, you want to store formats upright, uh, so uh, cassettes on the long edge, like um, like books on a bookshelf. Uh, you want to ensure that your shelving is sturdy enough to support the weight uh, of the materials. Um, and, and just a general rule of thumb with magnetic media, you want to store those tapes without rewinding, um, and you would rewind before playing or before digitizing those, those tapes. Again, general uh, red flags for the environment where you're storing your, your materials. Um, you want to be wary of uh, warm temperatures and humid. Uh, you want uh, typically to store your materials uh, in dark places. So you want to avoid UV light uh, exposure. Um, 
you want to wash and dry your hands before handling any any of these materials. Uh, you want that environment where you store your media to be clean. No, no food, no drink uh, in, in that area, at least. Um, and, and have like minimal exposure to, to light, um, minimal exposure to strong magnetic fields. You want your storage media to be away from radiators and vents and keep your media or storage media away from sources of vibration. So this is kind of giving you a panorama of, of what you have and kind of like how to organize. And with this, uh, with this knowledge, you'll be able to kind of like develop priorities um in in order to um priority prioritize uh, what to digitize or um uh, what to give kind of like the upscale storage digital storage uh, treatment um but of course this is gonna gonna vary in a number of factors um so um there's the the your current resources, um, both economical and, and human, um, but also the risk factors inherent in the media carriers. So you wanna usually wanna take care of the older older media first, um, or the media that has a worse uh, physical condition. You also want to take a look at your collection holistically. So if you have a significant number of digital files, so maybe you concentrate on kind of like building a digital preservation infrastructure at home. Um, you also want to uh, take into account the significance. So if you have a high priority or very significant collection with digital media, you want to you want to tend to that. Um, so what are your most representative works? Um, that, that will give you kind of like a, a, a way uh, to prioritize. Um, depending on where you are and at what point in your career you're finding yourself, you may be considering embarking on a dis distribution ag agreement with an organization. So this is just to briefly uh, include reputable media art distributors that, that I know and trust and, and are friendly to artists. Um, and, and not only that, but they're known for their commitment towards preservation and providing access to, to, to their artists and to the works that are in their roster. So another thing to, to note about these uh, media art distributors like Electronic Arts Intermix and Video Data Band, et cetera, is that they sell work that is on edition. So this has no limit to the number of copies that may exist of, of a given work. However, there are restrictions governing who may make copies, how they are made, and how they are used or exhibited. So these restrictions are outlined in license agreements that you know, are signed, obviously, before the work is sold or exhibited. So I mean, this is uh, to get you, or, or the, the point of this slide is to get you to start to think about um, what, what those uh, restrictions, if any, would be for, for your work or for the work that you would want to distribute. Um, um, this on addition model has like historical roots in kind of like the, 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 the notion or the uh, uh, conceptualization of, of video as a medium that was easily reproducible and therefore, therefore kind of like democratic and, and widely accessible to, to the people. <laughs> um, so, so it's kind of like a different uh, economic model than what you may find in the commercial gallery system. So this is, um, yeah, just, just so you're kind of like aware of, of this. Also, um, depending on where you are in your career, uh, I'm also including a link uh, for the John Mitchell Foundation's Create a Living Legacy Workbook, um, which I highly recommend to help you plan and protect 
sorry, to, be, to help you plan, canal, and protect and safeguard, uh, you know, like an artist's legacy and work, whether it's yours or, or a friend's or, <clears throat> or something of the kind, or if you're acting on behalf of somebody. Finally, uh, on this slide, I'm sharing a couple of resources. Um, it, we, we covered a lot of ground in, in this workshop. Um, so, so here is the Transfer Collective website. Again, we, we provide digitization uh, services for, for artists and activists and, and individuals at a, at a very low cost. Um, so also the Preserve This Podcast sign. There is also, if, if you're working more with software and interactive art, there's um, the best practices for conservation of media art by Rafael Lozano Emer. Um, there's a self-assessment guide. Um, there's a Matters in Media Art website and kind of like media, media conservation resources when you're working with, uh, with museums and galleries, et cetera. Um, so I'll, I'll share these slides with you and, and, and feel free to, to, to dive into them. <laughs> um, so thank you for your time. I know it was a lot, uh, a, a lot of ground covered, uh, but I hope it was uh, useful to you. I'm, I'm, I'm available if you have any further questions or if you have questions, we can take them now. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that very informative uh, presentation. Um, I wish I had known that tidbit about Sharpies on CDs 20 years ago, because now I have 150 CDs with Sharpies that will bleed. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a little anxious about transferring that uh, data over, uh, prioritizing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of curious about, I know we have a lot of people um, that tune into ArchiveX that are working with video formats. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, uh, based on your perspective from the museum uh, sort of archivist role, like is there a video format that might be best to uh, preserve oh. files in that might be more future friendly perhaps? Yeah, we get this question a lot. I mean, depends like everything else um but for example for for video for moving image like born digital um a rule of thumb or a guideline uh to aid in the selection of a video so like whether you're uh considering um finishing to prores or you're finishing to h264 and pick four or whatever is to select a format that is is open. So ProRes uh, is is a close, is a proprietary format. So we generally advise against that. But the, the counterpart to that, um, to to using ProRes, for example, to finish uh, an artwork, is that is widely used. Um, and it's like the de facto format for a lot of edit houses, or it has been for, for a while. So you should feel certainly, or some level of comfort in, in using a format that others use. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's no, no one like magic bullet or, or like one magic format that um, is, like the the holy grail of preservation but mm -hmm. i mean just just my, my advice would be to keep doing what you're doing <laughs> and and kind of like keep up to speed with kind of like what the industry standard is uh, for for like edit houses for example or netflix actually publishes um kind of like their technical guidelines or specifications for the type of work that they uh, or the files that they receive for deliverables. So kind of like keeping up to speed with that, don't be too afraid about esoteric file formats. Um, but so long as they're open and kind of like well described, you, you should be fine. Yeah, I guess that question also translates to if I take those 150 CDs and DVDs, do I do an, you know, an MPEG-4 or a dot .move uh, transfer or like, 
you know, what is that format to, yeah, as you said, there's no magical format, but it's sort of like, I think that's the question that lingers is like, migrate it to what, <laughs> to what, you know. Yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, that's another workshop <laughs> altogether, honestly, uh, because you could also create a disk image of, of those uh, DVDs or optical media that you have. I mean, it kind of depends on what's in them, what's or like what's the original format, because sometimes in optical media is only able to hold kind of like a lower resolution video files. So maybe you have a higher resolution somewhere else. So, you know, it depends. Um, yeah, that's another workshop. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll consider that uh, a proposal. Um, <laughs> can you talk a bit about um, some of the challenges of analog film that you've encountered, um, especially with artists and, you know, different waves of analog film. A lot of artists are doing experiments with analog film or attaching objects to the film itself or doing these chemical processes that may be, um, you know, putting plants on the film and using emulsion to get an image and these experimental processes that may be more challenging to conserve. Um, I'd love to hear sort of how it looks from your end. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love that kind of work. <laughs> actually, <laughs> listen, uh, film is actually quite, quite stable. <laughs> Out of the, the formats that we discuss is the one that we actually know that can, in proper storage conditions, uh, can last uh, pretty well for up to a hundred years. So that being said, like if you are experimenting with emulsion and um, you know uh, attaching leaves or like or you are working with organic materials uh, and film, um, you should certainly save uh, that original role of film. Uh, but um, you would you would transfer that or you would uh, scan that perhaps scan that roll of film into a digital file, or you would copy that, that sorry, copy that a uh, roll of film into um, an internegative from which you would make positive screen imprints. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, so it's like create, generating kind of um, copies of, of that original roll, which, admittedly would be somewhat unstable because you're you're working with uh, organic materials in, in the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I really loved what you were saying about sort of leaving instructions for how to install your work as well. Um, I was wondering if you have, um, if there are some examples of artists that do this very well, um, of which we could find examples of online, uh, perhaps, or you know, have access to things like that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Rafael Lozano Hemer, uh, which is, I link to, kind of, it's kind of a, how do you say it? Uh, well, not a rant, but a, a, mani a manifesto. <laughs> it's kind of a manifesto. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and he does that uh, very well and very publicly in his web in his website with his other work. You would see like technical manuals about how to install and how kind of like the technical information of um, his 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 artwork, which is um, uh, fairly often like software based, hardware based. Another one would be um, Jim Campbell, another artist that's also very good at. Um, documenting his processes or like doing kind of like having a technical narrative of his artworks um, that you could um, find on their websites. Um, EAI also has a good chunk of resources, uh, electronics arts intermix um, about kind of like describing technical processes and um, you know, kind of like the differences between, or, or like choosing like uh, how to project or, um, 
you know, kind of like moving or navigating, displaying your artwork in kind of like a gallery museum setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are great. Thank you for that. Um, we are taking questions from the audience. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll have a couple of more minutes um, for the discussion. Um, I guess, you know, I, I've seen some filmmakers that I deeply admire put a lot of their work on online platforms like Vimeo or YouTube. And I'm curious to know what you think of that as sort of an, you know, an archival um, framework. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's, it's great because it's uh, opening up access. I mean, we see, we, we know, or we feel this much more now because <laughs> of our current conditions, right? Where we're confined to our homes and watching more art. <laughs> um, that I'm partly joking, but I mean, yes, I mean, it broadens access uh, and discoverability of your work. So in, on one hand, it's great. I wouldn't consider that an, an archive because once, if, if and when, Vimeo decides to shut down their service or charge. I mean, they already do charge, but um, I don't know, disrupt their service. Um, you no longer have that. So it's not really a sustainable uh, platform for archiving. Mm. I mean, if, if, if there's nothing else, uh, there's nothing else. I mean, it's, it's, is there? You also have to kind of uh, contend with your 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 current resources as an artist, right? Not 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 every artist is able to afford the three to one, right? Like mm -hmm. having uh, an ass or a raid, a raid, and having fancy cloud storage and kind of like having. Um, a robust kind of like storage or digital storage uh, infrastructure. So if Vimeo if if Vimeo or YouTube is your way, it's your way. It's fine. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about Vimeo, but I do know that YouTube, for example, compresses your video files and mm. upload them. So that's another thing to consider that you may be altering your work a little bit. Mm -hmm. So these are things kind of to look into when you're deciding what to do. Right. There's always a trade-off somewhere in there, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear of an example of um, maybe some some archives that maybe were inherited uh, or collected or acquired by the museum that um, you had to sort of re- you know, sort of engineer in reverse because there wasn't much information um, and maybe how that, how that looks on the back end. So you're talking about like artworks that had to be uh, reverse engineered, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how that looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What sort of, you know, pieces do you have to pull together when we don't leave the, the correct information <laughs> and the artist is no longer living yeah, yeah for example oh wow yeah i mean it's uh, uh, a research process um so for example uh, i mean it depends right obviously but you would talk maybe to a studio assistant or you would investigate where the work was shown um see maybe if there's a, a technician that you can talk to that worked on a given installation that can give you kind of like some pointers or some technical um, or that has some like technical know-how of how a given artwork functions. But not, not only that, that also has kind of like the experiential um, sort of like embodied knowledge of, of putting, putting a work together in in, in a gallery setting or in a museum setting. Um, so that's kind of like the research aspect. And once once you know, or once you find out one, what the underlying technology is for the artwork, mm -hmm. it would sort of like determine if it's appropriate to, to intervene 
or to reverse engineer. So for example, I don't know, like Rafael Lozano Emmer has like some, some artworks that he wrote on, on Delphi, which is like an older uh, programming language um, that I believe that he has since updated to kind of like a more modern programming language. Um, so you would determine whether that's appropriate, if if you're if you would like update uh, the programming language of a of an artwork, or investigate if if he or she has already done that. Um, there's a lot of um, research and kind of uh, ethical considerations uh, that need to take place before actually doing what we call treatment or like reverse engineering an artwork. Um, once you do that uh, and, and you determine whether it's good to go, um, the actual work of restoring is, is not, if you have the technical expertise, we, which we often don't have, and we have to like uh, collaborate with others, uh, that, that actual of, that actual work of restoring is not that um, it's not that excruciating. <laughs> sometimes, get, sometimes getting the information is the is the hard part. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. So you have to figure out where your start in the process is. Um, well, thank you so much. That was really like such a generous presentation and. Um, I think it leaves us with a lot to consider. Um, can you say just a few words in closing about some of the, um, expand a little bit more on Transfer Collective and how Transfer Collective works with artists and their archives? Sure, we'd love to. Um, look, look us up, uh, we're on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but basically we, we started, uh, there, there's a little bit of a history, um, and I can talk about that. It, it started, I think, sorry, I won't say the year because I'm gonna fumble that. But some years ago, it started as uh, as an exhibition in the new museum, the transfer station, where there was like an open call for, for artists in New York City to uh, bring their videotapes to be digitized. Um, that grew into a collective and, and uh, kind of like the, the one partnership model that we established is that um, we digitized six tapes over the course of six months uh, for a very nominal fee. So like less than market value, <laughs> basically. Um, with, with the condition or with the caveat, I mean, we we, we work through our partners uh, in thinking about this, but the caveat is that uh, we, we are also thinking about access. And so we, we strongly encourage the people that we partner with to make their videos available on the internet archive. Um, so we upload those files to the internet archive and they can be viewed um, by anyone. <laughs> Uh, but that's also where um, the people that we partner with can um, access their their preservation files. So they're like high high quality or high definition or like um, high quality uh, preservation files from from that um, from those videotape. Uh, so, so that's one thing that we do. Um, if you're interested in that, just uh, shoot us an email and, and we'll get back to you. We're always looking for people to partner with. But in addition to that, we also do things like this. So we have like workshops uh, for different types of audiences um, about how to kind of like take care of, of your media, and precisely your digital media, um, since it's the output of, of digitization. Um, we also, in the recent past, have done a lot of pop-up events at galleries and bars where we bring our equipment uh, to a location and have kind of like an open call for people to bring 
their home movies on mini DV or VHS or whatever, and they can book two hours of our time. And so we digitize uh, that tape for them and, and give them a file at the end of the day. Mm. Um, so th those are the things that we kind of do. It's, it's um, yeah, it's we, we provide digitization services, but also we educate uh, about how to kind of maintain uh, your your collection or your files or your digital corpus. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Caroline, for this incredible talk. Um, so grateful you accepted the invitation and you know, I'm, gl I'm glad we'll have this sort of video to, to review again. There is a lot of information that's really useful. So a big thank you yes. and a big thank you to our audience. This is the final live stream of ArchiveX um, in this incredibly long year, 2020. <laughs> so uh, just a big thank you to our audience for tuning in and to Caroline for joining us tonight. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you all for, for being here.